We have with us Mr. Uh, Kenneth Rogoff, author of the famous book Curse of Cash, and he's also the professor of economics at Harvard University. Thank you for talking to Bloomberg Quint. My pleasure. Um, Kenneth, inflation is uh, trending below expectations in a number of uh, key economies, including the US and UK. What is your analysis as to why this is happening? It's a big mystery to economists why inflation is still low, particularly in the United States, because labor markets are tight. Mm -hmm. And the best idea I've heard is that there's still downward pressure on the share of labor in the economy. Wages, the wage pressures are downwards from mostly from technology and globalization. If wages aren't pressuring up, then you're not going to get pressure on prices. So I, I think that might not go on, it could reverse, but it still seems to be happening, even in the latest uh, labor market report in the U.S. Despite a very tight labor market, wages are still very weak. So I think that should give central banks pause about raising interest rates too quickly. Uh, will lower than expected inflation delay a normalization of the monetary policy in U.S. and uh, Eurozone? Well, I think it leads to a reconsideration of what normal means. And part of the reason in my book I talk about the need uh, to develop the infrastructure, the do the homework to have effective negative interest rate policy, it's possible we'll have very low equilibrium uh, policy interest rates for a long time. Eventually, we're going to get a deep recession, maybe not the next one. And I think policymakers will be scrambling for ideas of how to respond. Uh, in U.S., Fed is opening, uh, Fed is uh, uh, hoping to uh, normalize its balance sheet. Uh, do you think the process will uh, begin uh, smoothly? I think the process of normalizing the balance sheet in the United States is a pretty easy thing to do because I think the balance sheet was smoke and mirrors. It really didn't do that much so-called quantitative easing. So undoing quantitative easing won't either. They need to do it very slowly because it still has a mystique. There are people who do think it's important, but I think it's pretty clear that its effects are fairly marginal. Europe is another matter because there, the balance sheet represents transfers from the, the northern countries to the other countries. They have to move very cautiously on that. Years of easy liquidity uh, have led to them uh, have led to an increase in the asset prices, uh, including in the emerging emerging world, and they are inflated. Uh, so, do you see that as a risk uh, at a time when central banks are uh, talking about rolling back their easy money? Well, they're talking about raising their easy money policies very, very slowly. So at the moment, it's not a prominent risk. But yes, if you ask what is the biggest risk to global macroeconomic stability, it's something that significantly raises the equilibrium real inflation-adjusted interest rates around the world that will force everyone to respond then these very high asset prices, in some cases these high debt levels, could be very problematic. Italian debt is an obvious example, uh, but we can find them across the world. Uh, Olivier Blanchard, who, uh, like me, was a former chief economist at the IMF, has mused, suppose productivity goes up. That would be good for the countries where it's going up, but it might make world interest rates go up and cause a lot of problems. So there are vulnerabilities, but on the other hand, most projections of the interest rates this will be very low for a long time, and that rationalizes higher debt levels, higher asset prices. Uh, you were critical of uh, India's uh, demonetization move, um, but if we see the economic data, uh, the, our economy was less affected uh, due to demonetization than what we had expected. Um, so uh, were you surprised because of this? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't regard myself as in the vanguard of critics of demonetization. What I said is, this isn't how I said to do it in my book. And uh, I had been very careful in the book to say for emerging economies, developing countries, this is something to wait a, lo a much longer till advanced economies have done it. Uh, so I think uh, where we are with demonetization is that the negative effects on output have been less than the sharpest critics have said, 
uh, more than people are saying, you know, it was painless. And we also have seen that if you look at black money, they didn't initially capture much of it, although the government still hopes to see where the bank accounts are and make some profit off of that. The big question going forward is what is the longer term effect? How will it interact with the GST? What will be the effect on, uh, for example, the use of cash in the future, financial inclusion? Will more people turn to using debit cards? Not immediately, but over the long run. So I, I think even though there are a lot of studies going on about the short run impact, it's really only over many years we'll better understand the full impact. Uh, what is your view on GST? Do you think it would be beneficial for the economy? I, th I think GST is a huge step for India in terms of uh, creating a more federal tax structure, getting rid of some of the chronic problems between the state and the federal government, uh, having the Indian economy be more like a single market. So there's uh, a tremendous promise. On the other hand, due to political compromise, the GST is way more complicated than I think the government, the central government would have liked. There's the hope the states will see it's working and then agree to something simpler. But yes, I think it's a big positive development. I, uh, that seems very clear. Uh, during the seminar, you said that Aadhaar was a good project uh, which has been uh, laid out in India. Uh, but there are, uh, there are so many privacy concerns related to the Aadhaar in our country. So how do you balance between these two? I think every country is going to end up doing this, as I said, because even in the United States where the privacy concerns are huge, I wouldn't advocate doing it in the United States. But I think eventually having cybersecurity is going to require biometric identification. I think everything else uh, will be defeated and biometric identification is going to be essential. People are going to demand it, not just complain about it. I also would guess, uh, unfortunately, that at some point we may have a dramatic terrorist incident which pushes the country to look for biometric identification. The Europeans are already moving in this direction. If you're an airline passenger in Europe starting in 2018, uh, when you take your ticket, you're giving passive assent to them scanning you uh, and you know getting knowledge of your facial structure, putting it in a database. So this is sort of happening. Uh, India has done the, uh, phenomenal keeping track of the data. But yes, no, I, this, is, this isn't something we could do in the United States, nor would I advocate it. it would, people would uh, not, not permit it. All right. Thank you for talking to me. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.